This is Startup Storefront. The best part about making cookies is eating the raw dough off the mixers. High risk, high reward. This can make you seriously ill. Between the flour and eggs, salmonella is a real threat. Sweet Lauren's, the number one natural cookie dough company in the United States, has created the solution we all needed. They make gluten-free, dairy-free, plant-based, and nut-free cookie dough. It comes in pre-cut portions, bakes in minutes, and can even be eaten raw. Sweet Lauren's is transforming what it means to be convenient and delicious. In this episode, we talk with Sweet Lauren herself, Lauren Brill. Listen in as we cover how a cancer diagnosis shifted her priorities at a time when most of her peers were living a carefree life, how she got into major grocery store retailers, and how staying scrappy in the early days hindered the company's growth. Pull up a chair and take a seat at our table, because everyone's welcome to this cookie party of an episode. Welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Lauren, founder of Sweet Lauren's. For people who don't know, what does your company do? So Sweet Lauren's is an all-natural, clean-ingredient food company, and we're the makers of the number one natural cookie dough brand in the, the U.S. Number one natural cookie brand. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank Big you. To you on Tastes that. like the number one. It's amazing. <laughs> You're it's here because favorite. you have the biggest fan. Her name is Lexi. She's sitting to my right. and she oh, makes me so she's, happy. She's uh-huh. such a fan of your product, and every founder has a good story and why they got started. So what, what brought you to want to start this company? So I have a crazy story. I actually, I'm from New York City and I moved, I lived out here for college. I went to USC and right after I graduated, probably like two months after I graduated college, you know, still figuring out what am I doing with my life? Yeah. Yeah. But excited, right? Like I'm an adult now. I get to jump into a real job in the real world. I got diagnosed with cancer. That's heavy. It was super heavy. I was 22 years old. What kind of cancer? The last thing you'd expect. I had Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay. Stage two. And I had to do six months of chemo. And Did they do surgery wow. first to like rem- try to remove it? No, it was it's in it's in your lymph nodes, okay. so it's really it's just it's, chemo. It's it's a it's a blood cancer, so you yeah. really need chemo to to really clean up your blood. So it was crazy. Like I, the last thing I would. What expect. is this like for you mentally? So there's a there's a concept of like like the Jew. This is heavy. I get that, but it's like, did you accept death as an option? It was crazy because, you know, I, when you just graduate college and you feel young and free, like I felt invincible. And then to hear this, like it was honestly unthinkable. Like when I found it because the lymph nodes in my neck, one day I just woke up and they were so swollen. Like It was like, literally that instant. It, it was literally like was like, I mean, my doctor said it probably was slowly growing in me for probably a year, year and a half, but, but I had no other signs. So you know, it was undetected. And so I just, you know, something was definitely weird with my lymph nodes. Uh, My mom, unfortunately, had cancer. She had a type of leukemia. And so she had an oncologist. And so she immediately, you know, 22, you're also done with your pediatrician. Like I didn't even have like my new doctor. And she was like, just, you're coming to my oncologist. And he looked at me. Did your mom have cancer or was she, she 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 had had it previously? No, she was, she had a type of leukemia that there just isn't a cure for. And so, unfortunately, she passed away 10 years ago. But I'd grown up, like, seeing her go through treatments and things like that, you know? So it... Not easy. Not easy. And the thing about Hodgkin's lymphoma is it's also not even related to leukemia. So, but I went to her doctor and, you know, I trusted her doctor. I'd, like, known him. And he, he said, you either have nothing at all or Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I didn't even Google Hodgkin's because I couldn't even... Like that was like that was crazy, you know. There's you, no you way. You heard nothing at all, and you're like, "Oh, that's probably it." It's like, of course, some people like they'll just figure this out. Uh, it took a month of testing because, again, nothing showed up in my blood work. I wasn't having any like night sweats or like weird, you know, signs. And so, um, when they did do a biopsy, um, they found a lymph node in my neck, and they did a biopsy. They found out, you know, it was in fact cancer. And so. Yeah, I think when he gave me that news, I just honestly, I've always been a very happy kind of upbeat person. And I literally like, for the first time, just like hit ground zero. Like I just was like, wow, I might not live. Wow, even if I do live, am I ever gonna feel great again? Like, am I gonna be scared for the rest of my life that I could get sick again? Like, am I gonna be like, I don't know, uh, just carrying this baggage for the rest of my life. And so I think like I just went this, to this really dark place and that's not who I ever was. And I, I think after like two months of that, I realized how terrible feeling bad feels. And I just was like, I hate this feeling. Like this is hopeless. Like I was watching like daytime television. I'd never really 
you know, I was not one of those people that right. like sat around. At 22, you're you not know, really. Like <laughs> yeah, like I'm not used to be going out and traveling the world and hanging out with friends and, you know, partying and having fun. And I just, about like two months into it, something in me just like snapped. And I just was like, I'm not going down this road. Like I'm going to do everything in my power to get healthy, to get past this, to feel better than ever when I'm healed and turn this into a positive. And like, I literally just created like this tunnel vision and was like, no one else is going to do this for me if I want this different outcome and feeling. I just have to do it myself. And so I just tried to kind of push anything negative away. Was this during chemo that you start to make the switch? Yeah, it was about two months into the chemo treatment. Wow. So this is like you weak, very much weak. Yeah. And something just switches. I just was, I mean, it was still so hard. It's not like all of a sudden I was like, this is happy, but I was like... I think I just really realized how we're just in control of our own lives. And, no, you you know, something bad happens. Like, you can't bl- really blame it on something else. Right. Like, it's like, you know, this isn't where my mom could save me. My, You know, it's not – someone can't just swoop in and be like, I'm making this all better. I was like, I just have to know that I did everything I could right. to get healthy. Mm-hmm. And I really felt a connection. I think the other thing was, like, after that two months, I you know, I had this, like, just – crazy desire to be like proactive not just like okay doctor give me the medicine and I'll just do what you tell me but like what else can I do so I would say to the doctor and this is an amazing doctor in New York City you know has been doing this work for decades you know I was like what should I be eating what should I be you know exercising like like, tell me all the things I should do besides the medicine because thank god for the medicine like it cured me but I also know I helped cure myself and like I'm still living this really. Did he like, tell you? Did he tell you? Yeah. What you were the his response was. Because I know in Europe they do, but in here they, they keep, can't. His response was, "Keep doing what you just normally do." And I just that's exactly okay, it was my yeah. response. What? What I'm normally doing is obviously not the right working. thing. Working. Like, and so I was like, okay, food is so obvious to me. Like, food is just besides being like delicious and pleasurable and fun. Like, food is our like energy right the oat milk and so (laughs) we'll talk about that later but yeah what you you put in your body is everything it's everything like like if i don't have good energy how am i gonna fight this if i don't so i just was like okay food is number one i'm gonna start saying nutrition and then and i'm from new york city i feel like i'm very educated about clean food but like this was also about 15 years ago and this was also you just realize you're not taught nutrition in school. Like you have to genuinely be so interested to really teach yourself. So I was like, I'm going to study nutrition and just make sure I'm feeding myself like as healthy, good ingredients as possible. Cause I want to get stronger and pass this. And two, I'm going to start take cooking classes because the only reason we don't eat healthy most of the time is because it, you don't know. And, and like, it doesn't normally taste good or like healthier so option. True. That's actually a good, tr- yeah. 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 So it's like if I, if I can make <laughs> food taste delicious <laughs> right, and, but, it's and make it healthy, it's a win-win. Who, like yeah. who wouldn't want that? Yeah. And so I started just experimenting on myself because, again, I, w- I wasn't working. So like I was like, okay, on the days that You're I don't surviving. have treatment, yeah. I'm surviving, I'm going to like stay – I'm going to take cooking classes and I'm going to stay nutrition. And I just like built a schedule to keep me busy. And I started to really feel the effects of just like eating – tons of like you know vegetable like being really just being mindful like having a very balanced meal like like only whole grains only super high quality oils you know, like tons of different types of vegetables tons of different types of greens making sure they taste really delicious and i just started feeling genuinely so much mentally more positive had more energy more calm and more nourished and i was like i just fell in love with it i was like this this is the it's answer working. You felt it, it it's working. working and then of course like working out and just keeping like blood flow as much as possible. I mean, I couldn't run marathon, but like just trying to like stay as active as possible and trying to keep as mentally positive as possible. And how long did you go through chemo? So six months. Okay. So it was every other Friday was treatment and I just would feel terrible for like the whole weekend. And then like kind of by the next week, you'd kind of get your energy back. Then you'd have to like do another treatment. But, (sighs) but I know it's, I just think about was, chemo today and it's like, time. I can't wait to the time in the future where we just look back on that and we're like, that's the dumbest. Well, how, we how, was that? Poison our bodies how was that? How was that? But at the same time, I'm so grateful. Totally. Yeah, for sure. I mean, today like, it's the only, it, yeah. It, it cured me, you know, and the truth is my doctor, like it was super harsh. The first couple of times, like I fainted one morning, like I, it, it was so 
intense for me. But my doctor was really great. Like he was like, okay, we're going to also give you this kind of medicine that you take 24 hours before and this 12 hours before. And like by the end of it, like it was easier to manage. And I never like lost all of my hair, but like it thinned. Like I just didn't, I did not feel my sexiest best self, you know? So by the end of it, you're like, okay, I'm cured. Thank God. But like now I need to make sure this never comes back. And then how do I just like get strong, healthy Lauren back, you know? Mm-hmm. So, you know, that really kind of, it became my mission and it was just very weird to be like, okay, cool, now I'm like a carefree 22-year-old or 23-now-year-old person anymore. You, it's hard to be carefree yeah. after going through, through that. that. Yeah, you're like, shit is real. Yeah. And life is so You've precious. Yeah. And and you don't know. What else did this change besides like starting the company, but like what else did this change for you? Obviously, you're, it sounds like your diet, you became very proactive about, maybe intentional about what you what you consume, both probably mentally, but also literally. But like what what other changes did you become super like aware about that maybe most people who haven't had the same experience? I think I became what I was saying earlier, just like really uh, self-aware and and responsible for my own life. Like I just was like, okay, like there's some things you can't control. Like life is crazy. I couldn't control getting cancer. But like there are a lot of things in our control and like this, you have one life, like you got to own it and be like, I, I know I did everything I could, you know? So I think that just that ownership of your own life and responsibility, um, and not kind of blaming someone else or trying to have someone else save you. It's like, no, you know, you, you can be your own hero. So I think that was a major lesson I learned. And I also think just like life is so precious. And so I think a lot of when you're young, you're just kind of like, whatever, I have a long life ahead of me. I, you know, maybe you you just date the wrong people or you work for jobs that don't make you happy or, you know, and I, I think I just, it lit a fire under me that's just like, wow, like every day counts. I'm happy for you. I'm, I'm intense, yeah. but yeah, I'm yeah. intense because of that. <laughs> no, yeah. I love I'm intense it. too, I'm the same way. Right. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I do feel like I don't have regrets. Right. Yeah. I do feel like you I live them. that way. If you have them, you own them. Yeah. So I'm curious during those six months, how did you balance going through chemo and also going for this potential career that you were thinking you were going to have? Because I'm at that stage now where I graduated two months ago. Like Congrats. I couldn't imagine, thank you. Yeah. I couldn't imagine doing that now though. And so there's many people who have a hard time balancing their health to begin with when they're going after their dream career, their passion, whatever. How did you do that along with chemo? Well, so I didn't really have the idea for Sweet Lauren's yet. You know, I started cooking classes and definitely was was like, this is my lifestyle. Like, how could you not, like, you, you can eat the most delicious food, but have it be made of real, fresh, whole ingredients and feel great afterwards. And like, it's a win-win, you know? So that became my lifestyle. And then thankfully I, you know, was kind of cancer free. And my doctor was just kind of like, okay, now every six months, just come back for a test, but you're free, go. Like, Go be normal, you know. And I was like, I do yeah. not know how to be normal <laughs> right now. Normal. Your normal yeah. is different. And my now, new right. normal is different. So yeah. I, all my friends were already a year into their jobs and things like that. And so I was like, okay, what's my job? And I just wasn't passionate about anything. But I tried. Like I tried to enter finance, and I was like, oh, this is so not me. Ugh. I worked for a PR company, and I was like, I can't. You know, this is it's not like deep enough or connected to me enough. Like I actually started managing a restaurant in New York, and. I really didn't love the restaurant industry and I didn't love the people running the company, but I loved like the customer service. Like I loved making people happy. Like I loved, you know, the people that would come in and be like, oh my God, it's my favorite thing. Or, you know, and I was like, okay, like that gives me energy. So I tried a bunch of things. And I think after a couple years of like none of these things working, I kept cooking and baking on the side. And so a couple years later, I basically had created these cookie recipes and I f- just finally got enough like friends and family being like, you know, you have to do something with this. And so I realized mm-hmm. like, it's not just- Because they were delicious? They were delicious. And they it, are delicious. Mm-hmm. And and incredible. Incredible. So like Thank every you. time Even you wrong. went somewhere, were, were, were you I was asked always bringing. to- Well, I was yeah. always, I was always like, and I realized that baking really kind of became my hobby. Um, I, I minored in painting. So like, I love art and instead of kind of painting anymore. I Sorry, I feel when like, you said that, I thought of painting houses. I'm like, that's a minor, but <laughs> that, that is an art. Well, you're, well, yeah, you're yeah, describing yeah. it. No, like, you know, it's just, oh, I know why sorry, your brain sorry. went there, but yeah. it's interesting. It's the real estate development. Yeah. yeah. This stuff. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Got it. I just like being creative. I have to use my hands. Mm-hmm. And so I think I brought, instead of painting, you know, a sure. painting with, sure. art, with, uh, you this know, this is your art. This was my art. And yeah. so I was like, okay, it's, it's, it's therapeutic for me. It's a way to meditate. It's a way to like put my energy 
and emotions towards something that's going to create something positive. Mm -hmm. And so I started creating recipes and after hundreds and hundreds of trials. And what I mean, were, you, were you trying to solve for something like less sugar or like was there a health It angle was that more just like I lo there's nothing better than a warm cookie out of the oven to me or even sure. cookie dough raw, Same. right? Yeah. Same. Like you're Any baked good that's right out of the oven. Come on. It's like heaven. And in, and I'm like I'm someone who loves I'm such a fat kid like I'm, uh, uh, 100%. <laughs> I'll eat 40 of these. Just, <laughs> oh, like, yeah. Which I probably no should. No self control. But, I've literally, but tell me they're good for me and I'm they're gone. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I love like salads and all of that but it's like i am a dessert oh, yeah. i'm a chocolate you know person so hard to make a salad sexy yeah exactly and so i <laughs> i was like okay i just want to create the the best cookie dough and warm cookie out of the oven that just makes me actually feel great because i would buy you know again i'm in new york city so i'm around such amazing food and bakeries and high-end everything but everything's pretty much made out of the same ingredients you know it's butter it's heavy cream it's bleached or enriched white flour it's you know it just it's very refined processed ingredients and I was like my whole mantra about eating food is eating whole real so I was like okay how do I use whole grains instead of white flour how do I you know use chocolate that doesn't have soy and dextrose and all these kind of weird extra ingredients how do I just really make sure that every ingredient in there, like my body, you know, kind of, kind of can digest and loves the taste of. So that was the original concept. Yeah. I've literally tried every type of flour out there, every type of oil, every type of sugar. I mean, like I've tried it all and it finally got to the point where I was like, okay, like my neighbors are obsessed with this. Every time I go to a friend's house, I was always making new flavors and recipes. So I'd like always bring them and then people would be like, are you kidding me? This is amazing. And after I saw that like genuine reaction several times, I was like, okay, like, I'm not a crazy person, the only crazy person that wants this. You're not this. delusional. I'm not yeah. delusional. And you're like, seeing the signals. You should yeah, do something I was like, with it. Everyone wants a healthier way to satisfy their sweet tooth, as long as it tastes great. Like, it's just that simple. Truth. And, and so, a warm cookie. A warm cookie. And yeah. so then, so I was like, okay, clearly I need to be an entrepreneur too, because none of these jobs are working out. Like, I'm miserable. So, like, both my parents were entrepreneurs too, so I think it's it's in my blood. But I just was like, okay, I got I to gotta figure out something else on my own. And so I started a business taking this business course to write a business plan for Sweet Lauren's. And I was thinking, should it be a bakery? Should it be a product that's sold, you know, in CPG, sold in supermarkets? And in the course, this guy worked in Whole Foods. And he just worked in like the overnight shift restocking the shelf because he was trying to get his startup off the ground. You know, he, he wanted to open like a bike shop. And he was like, Lauren, like, like I'll get you a meeting with the buyer. And I was CPG, like, CPG, yeah. just like that. And I was like, I was like, well, I don't even know what I'm, creating yet you know and he was like Lauren just take the meeting so I was like okay, Lauren you're you're the one who's responsible for your own life like if you want to make this happen like give it 110 percent and just go yeah. so I just like got that attitude and I pretended I was a real company even though it was like literally you know yeah. this is I'm like living in my mom's apartment and these are all homemade in my mom's kitchen I mean it was it was you know the very beginnings but I made a whole one pager, got a presentation and met the buyer. And he was like, our team has never tasted something so good. Like, I'm a, I love this. Like, can we have 4,000? Yeah. Can we, tonight? how soon can we get them? <laughs> yeah. He was like, how soon can we get these? And I was like, oh my God, I have to find a factory to right. design packaging. Yes, I actually right. have to like oh commercialize God. this. And so I was like, <laughs> probably like a month or two. And then of, of, I think it took like about seven months yeah but he he kept his word and we just kept emailing and when we were ready he brought it in and then i was that girl demoing in whole foods giving out samples all the time and again like hearing tons of feedback from customers like that's mm -hmm. the best i want it's the best it's, the it's, best. it's gold you know right. and i tell so, everyone that's that's the whole thing that's the whole Whether thing you're a comedian you, you have to get that instant feedback, feedback. it's you have the to get whole it. thing you, you have to crave it you have to really reprogram your brain that's exactly it and you have to like throw your ego out the door like it's I realized this is not about me I don't even care if I like these flavors I mean I love them but you know what right. I mean right I just care you that could it's be wrong right. like your favorite happy. could not be yeah, yeah my yeah, favorite exactly. could be like an espresso chocolate that like it's your, it's no, your you like oat milk it's no weird. one <laughs> <laughs> no one's gonna buy right like, like the it's, classics uh, yeah like yeah. It, it, and it, that's the other thing is that it wasn't obvious to me but like there's a reason vanilla and chocolate are the most popular flavors of ice cream right it's like yeah. there are classics like chocolate chunk that you know are always going to be number one so I think I jumped in and I think the other thing that happened was I started to study the food industry which unless you're in the food industry, I don't think it's so obvious to everyone. You know, it's like, how does food get on supermarket shelves? How does the whole business behind it work? Like, it's it's actually crazy. Supermarkets meet with you once a year. Like, so only one time a year do they reset the shelf and bring in new products, pretty much. And, you know, I started to see that, like, in cookie dough especially, 
there is a duopoly. There's two companies that basically like own and run this this category, and it's it's what I grew up on. But for sure, it's not a product that I'd want to feed my children one day. And that just became like the vision. Like, what would I want to feed myself and my family one day? Like, that's the brand I'm going to create. That is what I believe the future of food will be. I think people are getting more and more educated. They want cleaner options, but you need to make it easy, delicious, accessible. And that fire got lit because. I just realized, like, if I don't do this, who's gonna? Yeah. And like, these companies will continue to win, and like, they shouldn't win. Did you have to raise capital, or be, or was it kind of like you had like a friends and family, but you already had the buyer? So you have like a different story where you take this meeting, then your pitch to your friends isn't, oh, yeah. I'm gonna take your money and p- pitch. It's more of like I have orders to fulfill. Agreed. And so Agreed. it's a better story. But somehow it was still hard. So it's I hard did, in general. I did raise, and it was crazy to me because like. People knew how hard I worked and how good the product was. And then we're in Whole Foods. And it's like, you still don't trust me? Yeah. Like, yeah. what? you should be writing me a million dollar check tomorrow. That's a good attitude to have, by the <laughs> yeah. way. That's the right attitude to have. But I couldn't believe, actually, how hard it was. You realize, like, even, you know, $10,000 or whatever. I mean, I was doing friends and family. So I was just was getting little bits from whoever, yeah. whoever would come in. And I actually couldn't believe how hard it was because, like, I know a lot of incredibly successful people. You know, it's interesting when you start writing checks for companies, how, like... Yeah. What, what has to totally align for you to be able to like just... Did you ever figure that out? What's worked for me is... So I, I, I brought on an angel investor and did friends and family. And since then, we've been profitable and haven't raised institutional oh, wow. funding, Good which is you. pretty unique Huge. in the food space. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank That's you. Um, very difficult. Most yes, companies it's incredibly difficult. Tens and... Tens and th- yeah, and they're yeah. not never profitable. And we've built like... I've been very focused on building a really good business so that we're not beholden to anyone and, you know, in charge of our own future. And so I think what I've learned is like the people, cause it's, it's interesting, even like family, right? Like your family, you think it's like your family, they're just going to write you right. like, but I think money is very emotional. And I think the people that were able to like really write a meaningful check and not even think twice about it were the people that live this lifestyle. So my angel investor was just like, I've eaten every fancy gluten-free product out there. And this it's, terrible like this is the best thing I've ever had right. like here's my money a hundred percent you are going to build the next brand name and I'm you know here to help in any way the product's fan. good I believe You're in you but so it's someone run. who really understands the lifestyle because I think there's a lot of people that are like oh it's a cool idea but like they don't fully buy into the lifestyle so they don't fully like see the opportunity and yeah. have the passion yeah. you know besides like oh we love Lauren we want Lauren to be successful we want it'd be great to make a return on my money one day you know it's like I'll tell you, know, you why I know yeah because I mean I'm an investor in the, in the almond milk up there uh, and now it all makes sense for you <laughs> but do you see how I am about it exactly I'm such a believer in the lifestyle <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and so you're totally right yeah yeah how quickly did you have to build out your team and what what was your first hire so after that meeting at Whole Foods So I was so scrappy, almost to a fault. Like if I could go back, I would have been like, hire the best team possible as soon as possible. But Can you elaborate on that? Just because our listeners, this is something I talk about all the time. And I think as an entrepreneur, you're two things, right? So your your mind is very dollar focused still. Yeah. Because you haven't seen the other side. Exactly. And in that you're doing yourself a disservice, but you don't know you are. And you think being scrappy is like a skill set that everyone should have. And I think it's because Gary Vee tells you to eat shit for years and live in basements. (laughs) But I think he's wrong. I think that's that's not the right approach. I think that, like, I'm glad. I mean, I love being scrappy. Our whole team, uh, scrappy to a point, you know, because I think you can be very frivolous too, especially when you raise money and you're like, okay, cool. Like, we can burn. We can try a lot of things. Like, I want to know where every dollar is going. So at the beginning, it was good to be scrappy because I got off the ground as a one-woman show, you know, which is super hard to do. And so I didn't have to bring on partners or give up equity to, you know, other people that way. But... I will say, I think like once you have product market fit, you get the best team possible together. I think the hard part about that is that like, it's not like the best team possible is like sitting across the table from you. Like if you don't have those super dialed in networks, if you, it's, it's hard to like assemble that dream team. And it's not just about someone with experience, it's that culture fit. And so like, it's, it's, you know, even we're now a real company and it's still hard for us to, to, we're, we're hiring people now. And it's like there's amazing talent out there, but are they the right fit for us? You know, so it takes a while to find the right people. But I will say that, like, you know, for too long I was scrappy because, honestly, we could have grown faster. And so I think I did hold myself back. But at the beginning, I brought on some interns that were, like, super 
helpful. Like they really helped, you know, I was like running the business, but they were doing everything else, you know? And so that really get, got me going for probably two years. I was just, it was just me and interns. And then I hired one full-time person that was kind of like my right hand. But the issue is like kind of bringing on a catch-all is like, then they're kind of a catch-all versus like a specialist, like a ninja in something. Yeah. And so I got us into all public supermarkets and then Kroger supermarkets. Okay. And when that happened, it was game changer because it was like that was that's buy in from the two the biggest supermarkets in right, the US. Everywhere. Yeah. And they brought Covered. us in full distribution oh, like wow. overnight, which doesn't Damn, happen. That's insane. It's yeah. insane. Good for you. Thank you. Wow. And so when that happened, I called <laughs> that's crazy. It is crazy. They weren't like, we don't need to test this. Yeah. This is going <laughs> yeah, nationwide. Yeah, yeah. They were like, they were like they were, I was like, how many stores? And they're like, you know, all People doors. Love cookies, and it and out. yeah. Yeah. And I like really that's would like awesome. go to those meetings and be like, bring this home to your wife. Tell me what she wants to buy. Like that stuff that's on the shelf or something like new. And like, honestly, that's how a lot of supermarkets really decide. It's, I mean, the buyer has to approve, but like they normally ask you to send a ton of samples so they can just give it out to, to like, friends, a, yeah. The, yeah, to everyone to be like, just genuinely tell me what you think. Give me feedback. Give me feedback. And if they're like, I love the product, you're like, whoa, there's an opportunity here. Especially because the cookie dough category has been flat or declining for the last decade. And then Sweet Lawrence enters and we grow it. So like they're looking for companies that know how to bring in a new customer. Unicorn. You know? Yeah. And Game so, changer. yeah. So was that finally the catalyst? That so, th sorry. So that, yeah. that was the catalyst was getting, getting that distribution. I knew we were going to be a real company. Like mm -hmm. I was like, we'll, we'll be a multi-million dollar company just because of this distribution. Right. I can now afford to hire someone high level. I don't have to stay scrappy. Mm -hmm. And so, and also I don't even know how to work with these huge supermarkets. Like you only yeah. get one shot. Like I need to make sure I bring on the best person possible. So we like skyrocket with them versus like, you know, filling out the forms exactly. wrong or do something wrong. Is it wrong. one buyer that decides for the country? It's one buyer. Wow. There's, that there's a dairy so buyer. Crazy. Yeah. It's really amazing when you start to understand how supermarkets that work. seems silly. They're looking, <laughs> well, they're looking at so for. much data. Right. You know, right. they're they looking at the so trends, much data. And like, it's basically like they're like our buyer's the dairy buyer because we're in yeah. the kind of the refrigerated mm -hmm. dairy section kind of near the cottage cheese and butter and eggs. And they have that shelf space and it's not very big, right? It, it's not like we have an, an aisle in the grocery store, it's like, you know, the refrigerated section isn't that big and they're in charge of growing it and making more dollars happen. So they're looking at like who could come in and bring a new customer and grow it. Because if we come in to just eat market share of what's already there, you're switching, you're just switching companies in and out. You're not right. actually growing. Yeah. That's so what's like, so amazing about, you said that the, the, the industry as a whole is, is like flattening or declining. And then all of a sudden they're just like, no, we're, we're all in to all of our stores. And you know, you're not trying to eat up market share, you're trying to grow it. So they're seeing, obviously, they're seeing a trend probably in a better for you space, not a healthy food, but like a an alternative to the overly processed stuff that we've had our entire lives. Exactly. I think, that, and I think that's what it comes down to is that like every category they're seeing is like going better for you and having options. And this category didn't have anything. And so they're like, okay, like this is our chance to bring in the millennial mom the, to anyone at this table, anyone who's like trying to eat clean, but also, you know, has a sweet tooth. You know, so our selling point for Sweet Lawrence is like, you know, we're non-GMO, really simple, good ingredients, nothing weird. So no junk. So you're like, okay. That person, you know, is our dream customer, but we're also gluten-free, we're also dairy-free, we're plant-based, we're peanut tree nut-free, we're kosher. So it's like, if you are- And it tastes great. Any of those things, oh, that's the thing. And that's if you just thing. want a delicious cookie. Right. So we try to capture everyone that kind of isn't a customer for the, for- the what, the, what stores are you in now? So we're in over 15,000 supermarkets now. We're in all Whole Foods, almost all Targets, we're in all Kroger's, Publix. Wegmans, Harris Teeter, All Stop and Shop, yeah. What do you personally want from this? Like, do you, do you want to run this company forever? Do you want to give it to your future kids? Or is it something that, you know, you, I think, you exit? You know, I'm honestly open. I, I just want to build the best brand and the best company and, and create the best products. And, like, honestly, we built this business with just cookie dough. Do you ever think to yourself what would have happened if you didn't have cancer? I do. I wonder, I wonder if I would still do this all the time. What's interesting is, do you guys know New York well? No, yeah, yes, okay. well. Do you know LeVan Bakery? No, that one I don't, you don't? know. Oh, no. Really? Okay. I've probably been to it. Okay. What I, part I'm of New York? I'm bad at names. Yeah, it's, um, they were on the Upper West Side, but it, they're known for like these big cookies. Anyway, I worked there before I got sick because it was my neighborhood bakery. 
And I saw the lines of people that would literally line up for these insane huge cookies. And they're, they're not healthy cookies, they're just delicious. And I just love the women that own the bakery and like, and how happy they made customers and honestly how happy warm cookies just make people. And I think like the idea was already percolating somewhere in me before getting sick, but getting sick just made me like, you know, turn it on its head to be like, you know, I just don't look at bakeries the same way. Like I, I, I want to feel great after I eat right. food. You've, so you've got a new filter. Yeah. Life now. And so, you know, every time I eat something that just makes me feel like really tired or like have a sugar headache or, you know, I'm just like, why'd I do that? I don't need to do that. You know? So I have no idea. I just know that like, I'm a creator. I have to get my hands dirty. I have always loved baking um, and sweets. And like, I, I was a yoga instructor actually before I got sick too. So I've always been inclined to this kind of more mindful, like healthy way of life. But I don't know, this fire in the belly and like looking at life, you know, like how precious it is and, and just kind of going going in 100% every day. It gave I, you jet fuel maybe. I, I, I think like, I think you need to really go through something in life to get that. Yeah. Because, you know, you can tell people this yeah. all the time, right. but it doesn't kick their ass. Yeah. You know, my ass was kicked and I was like, okay, like I know what it's like over there. I'm going to do everything I can to stay, <laughs> to stay over, over here, here, you know? Yeah. 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 You mentioned you're made in a nut-free facility. I actually, like, I know that the news dominating the headlines right now is is the the recall that you had. And I know that, like, things like that, they happen. It's an unfortunate part of doing business. But I'm curious about, like, what steps you have taken to combat that, get ahead of that, and how you guys are dealing with that right now. Totally. It was honestly the most shocking, like, terrible thing to go through. But thankfully, such a small amount of product is out there. But I don't know if anyone follows, you know, commodities in the oat flour market, but oat flour is a really, it's a big ingredient of ours because we don't use white flour. You know, it's a, we, we love oat flour. It's whole grain. It's really delicious. It has this great like neutral flavor. It's great. It's gluten-free naturally. So Q4 last year, we normally used to buy all of our oat flour in Canada. There's a big oat flour crop there and um, they had a major drought. And between COVID and labor and the drought, we, you know, we have a contract with these suppliers. Yeah. We've been using them for years. We have a contract with them supplying us X amount for the next year. They just said, we cannot supply you. And they gave us like one week notice. So <laughs> what does a company like ours do, right? You're, right. you're like, you pivot. Uh, you, you you've got to find a new <laughs> supplier. And so the hard part is there's a drought in all North America. It's not like there's oat flour popping up all over here. So we actually had to go to a different part of the world. We went to Chile. They sent us samples and, you know, paperwork stating like, this is gluten-free. We tested our factory. Everything was great. And so we were so happy that like we found a solution and found a whole new supplier in a couple of months because, you know, normally like that could, that could put a company out of business, you know? So we started using this new oat flour, and then we started doing some in-house just extra testing because we're gluten. We're made in a, in a very allergen-free factory, so it's nut-free, it's gluten-free, and so we started testing, and uh, we found some traces of gluten. The hard part with oat flour is that oat flour is inherently gluten-free, right. so it becomes not gluten-free when there's traces of wheat or something else in it. So the hard part is that parts could be totally good, and other parts can have the traces in it. Is that because like maybe the, the combine that they used to harvest it was also used to harvest We're wheat? still trying to figure out mm. where. It, the, their factory doesn't do wheat, but maybe in the crop. Right. Like it's, it's planted near a wheat field and the wind blows it over or yeah. something like that. Um, but yes, other factories could produce wheat on the same machinery and that's how it could create a cross-contamination. So we found out we had sugar cookie that it, thankfully it was only about like 6,000 cases, but sugar cookie that was sold across the US. And, you know, we wanted to do the right thing. And we were like, listen, no one has gotten sick yet or we haven't heard anything, but we were just gonna pull it from shelves because like our brand is about trust. It's about making people feel good. Like right. if there is a trace in here, like, we we have to take it. How do you do it? What are so you? Do it's you, such a. Do you call public? You, you call, call your buyer. supermarkets, and then you know you have to. And are they? Know, they must be like fuck this. Well, this <laughs> happens all the time in food. It does. We, okay. it does. It happens all the time in food because, I mean, listen, a brand wouldn't survive if if ninety nine percent of the time they weren't super reliable. You know. So, but I think like you're just dealing with so many components, like all these raw ingredients from different places in the world, and like everyone can give you paperwork and tell you like 
this is safe and this is exactly what it is, but what if they're lying, you know, or what if, you know, so you really have to build in the right procedures. So now we're, we're doing like three additional testing. We're going above and beyond all of like kind of the given protocol because we're like, this is never happening again. Right. And so I think in this in this crazy world where there's just supply chain challenges right now and everyone in the food industry has several different suppliers now for each ingredient because they want to be protected in case one of those ingredients can't ship, you know, you just have to, you're not just dealing with like one trustworthy source anymore. You have to like really build your own um, safety precautions. So it was a really good learning for us because thankfully it was one lot of sugar cookie dough, like it was a small amount. But, you know, you want to make sure that never happens again. You know, and even if it's one lot, they just, like, take all of it off the shelf. And you're right. just like, come on, the rest of it is perfectly good. We have tests <laughs> on all of them. But, yeah, you know. You can't be too safe. You, Yeah, exactly. Well, look, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much you're for having me. What an incredible me. story. Thank Honestly. you. Thank you guys yeah. so much. I appreciate that. Hey, you. Yeah, you listening. Thank you so much for making it to the end of the episode. If you just can't get enough, check out our subscription on Apple Podcasts. For only $4.99 a month, you can listen to the full-length, uncut, unedited podcast episodes. We're giving out life-changing advice for less than the price of your morning coffee. What a deal. Make sure to follow us on Instagram, subscribe on YouTube, and we cannot wait to see you next week for another great episode. Cheers.